Titus chapter 2, verse 13. I'm already there, so I'm going to start reading it. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this uh, truth that we're going to be looking at. We just pray as we open your word and look at these issues uh, concerning uh, this event, future event, that uh, you will give us understanding, insight uh, to these things. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I was saved in 1971. Uh, there was a book that came out in 1970. The name of that book was The Late Great Planet Earth. Any of you ever read that book? Not as many as I thought, actually. It was written by Hal Lindsey. He was a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. He put forth in uh, that book that the rebirth of Israel in 1948 was the fulfillment of Matthew 24. Why don't you turn to Matthew 24, verse 32. And I, I guess I would say that at the time that that book had a pretty big influence on me, uh, as I read that book, it was very exciting, very interesting book. Uh, he wrote another book later called Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. And that book actually was basically about being motivated by grace. And it was really a good book. But this book, The Late Great Planet Earth, his, this was his understanding of these things. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that the summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things come to pass, shall know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these, all these things be fulfilled. And he was putting forth the idea that when uh, the nation Israel was uh, re-established in 1948 that that was the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures about the rebirth of Israel and let me say that from my perspective now I don't really know that to be the case yes or no whether it was or not and whether the how this plays out toward the end of the age of grace if that really was the fulfillment of that or not but he was convinced that that was the fulfillment of that and then he says he said, based on this verse, that the generation that saw that happen would, be, would not pass away without seeing the culmination of all that, which would have been the return of Christ to the earth in the establishment of the kingdom, and before that happened would have been the rapture. And uh, I, I look back in that book, and I can't personally, maybe somebody here can give me insight about it, he said that a generation was 40 years. And from what, looking at that book, you know, closer, you know, now, and he just kind of makes that statement. And I don't really see that he ever made any case for why that was so. And I can't really personally, I've looked trying to determine or find where that says that or something like that. I can't find it. So if you could show me that, I would appreciate it because I can't see that. Uh, so he said, so if you take 40 years from 1948, that brings you to what? 1988. This, this is what year now? <laughs> Obviously, that came and went and nothing happened. But it did seem to me, maybe it was the church I was attending, Des Plaines Bible Church in Des Plaines, Illinois. It was pretty good bible Center church the pastor was pretty grace oriented there i learned a lot of grace truth from him it just wasn't a grace church and they never really carried it, the deal he never really finished the deal you know but he did teach a lot of good things there and and <clears throat> and so i wondered and it seemed like there was a anticipation maybe maybe it was just where i was but it seemed people were kind of looking at that, anticipating it kind of excitedly, thinking, thinking it was going to happen. And then over time, when that obviously did not happen, uh, well, then it seemed to be 
the, the interest in those kinds of things, to me, from my perspective, seem to diminish away. How many people have been setting dates for the rapture? I looked online, how many, you, I'm lumping here now the rapture with the second coming of Christ, but how many prophecies or predictions have been made about when the end of time, when Christ, the rapture was going to happen? And I'm not saying this is an absolute number, but in the 2,000 years of history since Christ and Paul, there's been at least 200. And it always seems as if these like the year 500 was, you know, there was a big thing. And the year 1,000. So, of course, when the year 2,000 came, whoa, that was sheer, sheer excitement, wasn't it? There was a guy, he came through our church about 1999, and, and he told me the rapture was coming in 2,000. And I met with him privately, and he went over a lot of things with me. And I said to him, uh, what if it doesn't happen in 2000? Oh, but it will. I said, what if it doesn't happen in 2000? Oh, but it will. Well, you know how that worked out. <laughs> I haven't seen him since, so I don't really know how he handled that. <laughs> in 2011, there was the big, you know, the Herald Camping putting out there the big thing. It was sometime in May, I guess, in the year uh, 2011. And... Uh, he had billboards. He paid money and had billboards put up all across the country that said, this is for sure. And he had vans going around the country with loudspeakers on the top, driving through neighborhoods and whatnot, telling people that this was for sure. Now, I'll say this. You need to be ready. Whenever it happens, you need to be ready, don't you? I was talking to Ed, and he was telling me he was at the ball game in uh, Cleveland, that day when that was supposed to happen and when that moment came i don't know there was a time i guess associated with it and that moment came and went past and there were some people sitting in the ballpark you know down from him a little bit and they all stood up and they said we're still here <laughs> i don't really know what those people were thinking about, you know, I mean, an unsafe person probably wouldn't have made a statement like that. And as, as I'm going to share a little bit here, there's a lot of people who are probably really Christians who really don't like the rapture and actually despise it. It might have been somebody like that even. <clears throat> These people setting dates, they make us look like fools. They make us look like idiots, like we're you know, the world out there has this picture of, they would lump us in as evangelical Christians, right? And, and we're just like a bunch of knuckle-dragging, benighted fools who believe, you know, that, that they built that ark thing in, uh, that's in Kentucky, isn't it? And the national news reporters are doing stories and they're mocking it. Well, you know, if the Bible's not true... And it is true, those people are the fools, not us. So why would you make a prediction about when that's going to happen? Why would you, and if you're a mid-ax dispensationalist, why would you make a prediction? You, that, because you're a mid-ax dispensationalist, that gives you some special insight into when that'll, can I, that's going to happen. Let me tell you, you don't have a clue any more than anybody else does. Now, I started going online and looking up things about the rapture, you know, and I was actually a little bit surprised how much negative, how many negative articles there are about the rapture, how many people are against the rapture and, and whatnot. And most of the people who oppose the rapture and don't believe there will be a rapture, they're people who are amillennialist covenant, you know, people, they don't make distinctions between uh, law and grace. They don't mean to make distinctions between the body of Christ and the nation Israel and things like that, you know. So you get in that camp, and of course there's no rapture, right? These people say the rapture wasn't taught until 1830. Did you ever hear that before? But, you know, the fact is the rapture was taught before 1830. And there's this guy named Paul. <laughs> 
You ever heard of him? My son's done this history project, and there were, I know the church fathers are just a real hodgepodge of nuttiness, but there were church fathers who did believe in something like the rapture catching away. Now, you know, they'll say the rapture word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, you know, it's not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in there either. So, I mean, if that's what you're building your case on, you really have nothing to go on. It seems to me like the departure from the rapture is, and even it's even in evangelical fundamental circles, there's a movement away from dispensational truth, it seems like to me. And it seems to be downplayed and belittled and not emphasized like it should be, even in places that traditionally, let's say, a Dallas Theological Seminary, which was, I mean, even Acts 2 dispensationalists will see the rapture, and, and even places like that where it's just not emphasized much at all. <coughs> the people who debunk, tried to debunk the rapture, there's a couple things about this. You, you start looking at the websites that are defending the rapture, and you'll find most of them are finding the rapture all over the place in the Bible, right? One, one article even said the rapture in the Old Testament. Now, there was something, there was a rapture-like event to one character in the Old Testament, wasn't there? But so when you start talking about the rapture, that's a, we'll, we'll look at the verse, you know, behold, I show you a what? Mystery. <laughs> so the, there's two passages really, we'll get to in a, in a little while here, there's two passages really where the rapture is found, our understanding, the catching away of the body of Christ. And 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So if you're going to go to those verses and you're going to try to belittle our understanding of what those verses are saying, and you're going to look at a verse like in Revelation where it says Christ is going to reign for a thousand years, and then you're going to tell me he's not really going to reign for a thousand years. Why should I pay any attention to what you say about the verses I use to support the rapture? If you can't figure that out, what in the world can you figure out? I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> Maybe I'm being a little bit too forceful in my statement, but the fact is it's true. <laughs> Spiritualizing is a dangerous place to be because then where do you stop? Once you start, where do you stop it? Now, you know, we, we believe you read the verses, you read the words, you take the what's the natural meaning of it. Obviously, sometimes there are figures of speech and whatnot. That's obvious then in most cases, isn't it? But when you start saying, Christ shall reign for a thousand years, and then you don't really teach that or believe that to be the case. Here's the problem. The church in the early days moved away from Paul, and they couldn't, they couldn't answer the question that the little 10-year-old kid asked me in the Sunday school class years ago, if Christ came to be the king of a kingdom, where's the kingdom today? Right? They couldn't answer that question right What's the right answer? Well, you know, that's what that's all about up there, right? That program was stopped and suspended and something else started, and that's what's progressing today. That's why we don't know if, you know, you can't look at events in the world today and know if prophecy being fulfilled in those events or not. You're just speculating. You're just, you know, shooting words out there that don't really mean anything. So in the early days of the church, as the church departed from Paul, they had to answer this question about what happened to that kingdom. So they, the answer they came up with was, well, it doesn't really mean that. <laughs> it you know, means something else. And then we can, it's just up to me to determine. Are you, uh, you, you're just as good uh, uh, of an interpreter, and your opinion is just as valid as my opinion when you start spiritualizing what those verses supposedly mean. Uh, and, and you won't really get very far with that, actually. So then about the 4th century, there's this guy named Augustine, and, and he put forth that the 1,000 years weren't really the 1,000 years and that we're actually in that 
now, right? We're living in that thousand years somehow. And you know, you know what that led to? This massive church that ruled the roost for, what, 1,300 years? And then when people began to get out of that, you know, it took some time to, to recognize everything that had been lost over that amount of time. So if the rapture, the idea of it catching away, wasn't really a predominant thing, that, that was why. You know, Martin Luther, for all the good things he did, he was still an amillennialist. And, and he, he didn't understand some things, so he says, well, why don't we just throw the book of James out because he couldn't see how James 2 lined up with Romans chapter 3. You know, if a cult person comes to your door and you tell them you're saved by grace through faith plus nothing, what's the verse they're going to pull out of their hat? James chapter 2, right? So do we have an answer for that? No, those people aren't going to receive it. But we have an answer for why those things are there. So spiritualizing leads down this road, then you don't really want to go down to the end of that road because then you don't really have anything that you can trust. Uh, Turn over to Romans chapter 5. We're going to talk about why the body of Christ is caught away or raptured out before this tribulation actually begins to start. And I know there's been people in the grace movement that have had issues about this. It seems to me this verse, this verse isn't personally, I don't think, really about the, the tribulation. But it seems to me that the understanding of this verse would, would have nailed, put the nail in that coffin just right like that. He says, uh, but God, verse 8, by, uh, Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I think verse 9 and, and as I say, I, I think when it talks about wrath there, I don't think it's talking specifically about the tribulation period, but it's talking about the wrath of God, and that would be included in that. But see, that verse right there should tell you that as a believer in Christ, that that's not an issue for you anymore, right? As a believer in Christ, as a member of the body of Christ, as a person who has had God's righteousness imputed to them, as a person accepted in the beloved and complete in Christ, do I need to fear the wrath of God? Didn't somebody take the wrath of God so I didn't have to deal with that personally? And when I place my faith in the work of his son in his death, burial, and resurrection for my sins, then the wrath of God wasn't really an issue for me anymore, was it? I don't need to worry about that. Now, that's a really a broad thing. So when you, tire, when you have a flat tire on a country road in the middle of a rainstorm, you don't need to be worried about God's wrath being on you because of you know, something you did. A lot of people worry about stuff like that, right? You know that. That's not really something you need to worry about. That's why you have AAA. (laughs) If you have a cell phone and you have AAA, you're good to go. (laughs) My tire went flat one night in December. I know how to change a tire. You know, I could do it. It was cold. It was windy. So guess what I did? I called AAA. That's that guy's job. I don't get paid to do that. You know. So, but wait, there's more. Look at First Thessalonians chapter one. Verse 10. This verse is talking about that specific thing called the tribulation. We're going to spend some time looking at some verses about that. 
He says, uh, start at verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had un, uh, unto you, and how ye turn from God, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus Christ, which hath delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, when it says the wrath to come, that's a specific thing. Look at Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist is out ministering, baptizing people. People are coming out there. uh, And then the Pharisees show up. Of course they would show up, right? Something's happening out there. They want to know what it is, what's going on. John John says to them when they show up, uh, verse 6, Matthew 3, 6, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But... But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers! That's really a good way to win your audience over, isn't it? (laughs) O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So when you get to that phrase, the wrath to come, that's talking about a specific thing. There is wrath coming. You know, just because things have continued a certain way for a long time, it doesn't mean they're going to stay that way forever. It's been 2,000 years now since Jesus Christ came and the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and God's been holding his wrath back because of the age of grace. The long-suffering of God is giving people the opportunity to hear the gospel of grace of God and be saved. And he's building the body of Christ, right? What is God doing today? He's building the body of Christ. You are blessed to be a participant of that, right? And wow, you stop to think, you know, humble little old me. And I am a member of the body of Christ and part of what God is doing today. That just blows my mind. But he says, who hath borne you to flee from the wrath to come? There's some other things here he talks about. Uh, a baptism of fire, and you know, you've heard the phrase "baptism of fire," right? That's that's where that comes from, and and it's usually used as soldiers who have gone through combat for the first time, right? I mean, that but it could be used in other ways as well. But we're going to talk for a little bit about this wrath to come. Look over in Psalm chapter two. <clears throat> There's a specific thing. In, in the program of Israel, and that's what that's dealing about. Chap, uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? So there's the heathen there and the people are Israel. Why do they imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. It, it says in uh, Acts 4 that the events of the earthly ministry of Christ and then those events after his ascension were the fulfillment of this right uh saying against his anointed saying let us break our bands asunder and cast away our cords from us here's god's response he that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh the lord shall have them in derision then shall he speak to them in his wrath you know i'm glad Obviously, I believe the rapture happens before this, right? But I'm glad I'm not going to be around for that. And he shall vex them in his sore displeasure. That's not something that you want to see ever. Now, I have some verses here. I'm going to try to go through them quickly. Isaiah chapter 2, you start looking at wrath. The tribulation is about wrath, okay? Isaiah chapter 2. We're just skimming the surface of this wrath stuff by looking at these verses. There's a lot of them. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 19. He says, uh, uh, I went too far. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, It says here, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear 
of the Lord for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they hath made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats. That's, that to me is a funny statement. <laughs> to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Now, you take that passage and you compare that to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. And we read here, start at 14, The heaven departed as a scroll when it, roll, when it is rolled together in every mountain and island and every... Uh, every island were moved out of their places. That sounds like God shaking the earth, right? Uh, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Why would person think that a believer in Christ is going to go through that? And I'm telling you, in my opinion, that this verse in Isaiah, a uh, verse in Revelation, is the same thing as in Isaiah chapter 2. And it's talking about the beginning of that time period known, known as the tribulation period. Now, turn over to Daniel chapter 9. I know we're flipping around here a lot, but you can handle it, right? There was a song that was played last night. I don't well, one of the kids' songs, and I heard that song. My my parents listened to the WNBI Moody Radio when I was a kid, you know. And that song was the theme song of one of those old radio shows. It was like, bam! I knew right away what that was. And one of the things they would do was they had Bible drills, right? Does then does anybody even know what that is anymore? We have a, at our church, we use a PowerPoint, and I like having it. I, I don't, unless there's some specific reason. This is just me, okay? I don't put the whole verse on the screen. I just put the reference. And you know why I do that? Because I know people will stop bringing their Bibles. And I want them to have a book on their lap that they open up and see, and then they can take that book home, and they know where things are in it. <laughs> anyway, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. You know this passage, right? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That that passage is one of the most fundamental passages is understanding the prophetic program, wouldn't you say? And, and and there's a time frame given, and my understanding of it is that the 69th week ended before Christ entered, or about the time Christ entered into, into Jerusalem and then was crucified later that week. So that means that the 70th week still remains to be fulfilled. And in the prophecy, there's a gap between the 69th and 70th week. Isn't it just amazing how God works that out, that the age of grace could fit into that time? God knows what he's doing. Yeah. But it says here, 70 weeks are determined upon, who's he talking to? The angel's coming, and who's the angel talking to? Well, Israel, but yeah, I'm looking for this Daniel, right? Of course, it's Israel also, but... He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Who are the people of Daniel? Israel. See, you're all so smart. Israel and upon thy holy city. Is that Las Vegas? <laughs> Is that some city in Missouri? What's that city in Missouri that the Mormons say is Zion? Independence, Missouri, maybe? Is it? No. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Is it New York City? Well, 
You know what city it is, right? Upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So what city would that be? Jerusalem. <laughs> That's like a no-brainer, isn't it? So if there's this prophecy about this time frame and it's determined upon Israel and Jerusalem, then what does the body of Christ have to do with that? Now, if you want to, you know, mess up your Bible and spiritualize a lot of things away and make the body of Christ spiritual Israel, well, then maybe you can make a case. But see, that's not, in fact, what's going on. (laughs) You have to deal with reality, right? I think you do. Now, don't turn there to save time, but you know in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, this time period is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, which tribe are you? Most of you aren't, I think. Look at Psalm 110. familiar with this psalm it's i think it's the most quoted psalm in the new testament i'm having trouble finding it there the lord said unto my lord sit thou at my right hand until i make thine enemies thy footstool you know what that's talking about that's talking about wrath that's talking about judgment it's also talking about the ascension Christ didn't ascend in Acts 1 because the age of grace was about to start, right? I hardly ever hear this talked about. Christ ascended in Acts chapter 1 because the prophetic time schedule was going on. And that was a part of it. You know, in Luke 19, at the beginning of Luke 19, they're coming down to Jerusalem and the disciples, it says they're waiting for the kingdom. They think think they're going down to Jerusalem and the kingdom's going to come, right? And Christ tells them this parable about this man that goes into a far country to receive a kingdom. He's talking about himself. I don't know if they got that or not, you know, but after his resurrection, they certainly understood it, didn't they? And how do I know that they understood that? Because I love the book of Luke. And I just, I love Luke 24 after the resurrection, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, you know, and and further on also, but... They're, they're so dejected and they're walking and Christ kind of falls in beside them and they say, oh, we had hoped he had been the one. And Christ says to them, ought not the Messiah to have suffered and then to enter into his glory? The thing that they didn't understand in the Old Testament was there was a coming to suffer and there was a coming with glory and that the coming for suffering had to be fulfilled and then there would be a coming for glory and that in that time between those two things, he was going away for a time. They didn't understand that before but I think they understood it later. And then he goes away in Acts chapter 1. He leaves them in charge running the show. They ask him, Will thou, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he doesn't say to them, You guys, I've been talking to you for three years and you still don't get it. I've heard preachers say that about them. That shows more about that preacher than it shows about the disciples. He says here, sit thou at my right, right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. We, we read a verse a little earlier that had the word enemies in it, didn't we? And what did it say about God's enemies there? Or if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. God's not dealing with his enemies the way he talks about here. Why would that be? You, you really need to answer that question, don't you? Because if God was dealing with his enemies the way he said he was going to deal with them when Christ left to go back to heaven, then we would all be in big trouble. Because you know what? As you were born into the world as a member of the human race, you were an enemy of God. It's just the natural state of all human beings. So aren't you glad... <laughs> that God's not doing this today. He's holding back that judgment and offering opportunity for people. Now, look at Second Thessalonians chapter 2.
this chapter is really all about that time period called the tribulation period and the wrath of God. And Paul says, and I'm not going to go down through this whole chapter, actually. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me say this. There were people, evidently, who were telling the Thessalonians that they were in this time of wrath. And he's writing these epistles to them to show them that they're not. So why would someone think that you would go through that wrath that Paul's writing these epistles to tell them that they're not in that? You know, remember Thessalonica? Paul goes into Thessalonica and he's preaching there and he's kind of run out of town after a relatively short amount of time, right? And then he goes on to Berea and those people in Thessalonica, they're so mad and incensed and worked up that they hear Paul is over in Berea and they can't just they can't stomach the fact that he's still around someplace then they go down there and make trouble for him there that's those people so there was a lot of persecution to the people in Thessalonica probably the believers they were probably suffering persecution localized anyway and, and you could see where maybe they would have thought that maybe this is it. And Paul says, I beseech you. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together with him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, you see what's going on here? There's people writing letters and signing Paul's name to them. So if you have the oldest manuscript, is that necessarily the best one? No. These are spiritual matters, and there's someone out there opposing these things. So, I mean, as a Christian, you should recognize that. So he's saying, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, with him that she be not soon shaken so there's suffering there's trouble they're having tribulation not not the tribulation but there's tribulation and he says i beseech you by the coming of our lord jesus christ and our gathering together unto him he's telling them when he says that you don't need to worry about that happening to you you don't need to worry about going into that time of wrath and tribulation because the gathering together i'm beseeching you by the coming of our lord jesus christ and our gathering together with him that word gathering together you know what it means it means all in one place i don't think there's ever been a time when all the body of christ has been in one place i i've thought back through my through the bible and i thought there has never been a time when that has been true now maybe you know when paul's the first member of the body of christ but christ is christ is still the head and he's in heaven so it's not all together right so paul's going around starting churches here and there and everywhere and there's members of the body of christ spread out all over just like now there's members of the body of christ spread out all over the place Boy, wouldn't it be a sad thing if this was the totality of the mem- of the body of Christ right here? That would be a sad thing, wouldn't it? But it's not. Hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> there are other believers elsewhere. And some of them are even grace believers. Some of them are even doing the work of the ministry that God has sent, uh, given them to do. So he's saying there, there's going to be a time in the body of Christ we'll be gathered together in one place i look forward to that day actually so he's saying don't be afraid of whatever you're suffering because there is this future event and we will be caught out before those events unfold those prophetic events we are part of the mystery program right right we're the body of christ we live in an unprophesied age We can't look at world events and say, oh, pull a verse out and say, oh, there's the fulfillment of that, or pull out another verse and say, oh, that's the fulfillment of that. That's just silliness. That's nonsense. There's no value in it. 
It's speculation. There's no edification in that. I, I hate to say my dad was really, he was a believer, but he was really, he really liked that kind of thing. And he, there's that show, Prophecy in the News. He, he watched that every week, you know. And I, he passed away before I ever really had the understanding to see if he would have understood what we believe about those things. So, you know. But I know one thing. Now, he believes it. <laughs> now, Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. So one of the people I'm looking forward to seeing is him and my mother, you know. The first person I'm looking forward to seeing is Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to seeing the Apostle Paul. But I think I'm going to go see my mom and dad before I see him. 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 51. Now, the people that don't like the rapture, they say that this passage and the passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 is just talking about the second coming of Christ. They kind of lump it together. But it's not. He says, Behold, I show you a what? Mystery. Here's something that wasn't revealed before, but is now being revealed. Now, we, there was this Enoch thing where Enoch was translated but see this is a this is a whole large group of people who are going to have this happen to them and he says behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed so there's an event that's going to take place in the future and there's going to be a mass resurrection of those people who are in Christ and when that happens let me back up a little bit there's a resurrection of the believers in Christ but there's also this instantaneous sudden change for those who are alive so there's a group of people there's a generation of believers that is not going to die you know I'd rather go that way than dying It's not so much the dying that's bad. It's you don't know what the process is going to be. You know, that's kind of scary. You think about that. But the result of the process, I mean, I'm okay with that. You know, it says in Ecclesiastes, the day you die is better than the day you're born. (laughs) And for a believer, that is true, isn't it? So he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So there's going to happen and it's going to happen. There's. There's no, the, the reason these people, this Harold Camping, I, I'm convinced he never really understood what the rapture even was. If he's going around setting dates like that. And I, and I would say, if you're setting a date that you don't really understand what that is. The, the rapture could happen anytime. It's an instantaneous event that happens like that. And there's no looking for signs. You know, the world's messed up today, right? That doesn't mean, I've heard this, I've heard this my whole life since I've been saved. Well, Christ has to come soon because of this or that or the other thing. And man, you look at the world and you get like depressed and you get, oh man, what a mess. And somehow it could go on. We don't know when Christ is coming back and the rapture is going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. And there's no event that has to happen before that happens. That The rapture is the catching away of the body of Christ at the end of the age of grace. And there's no verse that tells you when that is. Now, I see my time is running out here, so turn over to First Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the other passage that talks about this. Don't listen to anybody who says the rapture is in Matthew 24 or says anything else like that. That's not the rapture. He says in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For we believe that Jesus, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? So there's this instantaneous event that happens to those people who are alive. And then there's this resurrection of those people who have gone on before us. 
For we believe that Jesus, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are also, also which asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, so there's people alive, still alive when this happens, shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now you read that. And you read Revelation 19, where there's a description of the second coming of Christ, and you tell me those are the same things. They're not. In, in Revelation 19, there's a horse, right? There's no horse here. Now just turn over in closing back to Titus chapter 2. And we have the verse we started with. Looking for that blessed hope, Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope and for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what we're looking for. We're not looking for the Antichrist. Because if we were going through the tribulation, we would be looking for the Antichrist. We would be looking around trying to say, and how many people over the course of history have been asserted to be the Antichrist? You know, starts with Nero. That's going back a ways. So we're not looking for that. We're looking for this glorious event when Jesus Christ comes down into the proximity of the earth and he catches away the body of Christ. And I hope I'm alive when that happens. We had a man in our church. He was 94, I think. He was hoping for it too. It didn't work out that way for him. I don't know if it'll work out that way for anybody in this room. I can't say. I'm not going to try and say. But I know I'm waiting for it to happen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this uh, hope that we have in Christ to be caught up, to be with Christ in the air. It probably, I think, would probably be be the desire of all of us to go that way, but If we don't, that's okay too. But we do look forward to it. We thank you for it when our vile bodies shall be transformed to be like unto his glorious body. And we just thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.